Hey everyone, it's David Bombal back with Chris. Chris, you recently passed a security certification and I'm hoping that we can do a security video today, but firstly, welcome. Hey, it's great to be here, David. And wow, that's a way to, to come out the gate. So yeah. <laughs> what cert did you do? I went ahead and did the Certified Ethical Hacker, CEH. And I know, I know, I know, I know. There's a, a lot of different opinions floating around around that one. And uh, definitely we'll dig into that one. But I actually had a client, what happened is I had a client that went ahead and asked me to get it and uh, they went and helped me out with that. So um, boy, did I learn a lot, David. That said, the, the test is another thing. But I certainly enjoyed getting into uh, a lot of different new topics for me um, coming from a packet background. I'm hoping you're going to teach us something about Nmap. Oh, yeah, for sure. This is a tool that I've used for years, but I just hadn't used it to this level until I started really digging into it. For me, I'm the kind of guy, if I don't see it at the packet level with Wireshark, I don't really understand it. Uh, I came from a background of uh, that's that's what I would first do with a tool. I, I, I see a tool, I start up Wireshark, and then I compare what Wireshark sees with what that tool output gives me. So that's why we're here about Nmap. Yeah, so explain what are we going to look at today? Because I'm hoping that you're going to run Nmap and then do something, and then we're going to actually look at the packets. Is that what we're going to do? Yeah, for sure. If you are out there studying for a cybersecurity certification, uh, Nmap switches are going to be on your test. I mean, you're going to have to know them. Now, learning them is another story. Uh, really, we have one of two ways of doing it. You can either flashcard and, okay, what is dash S, capital S, dash S, T, uh, dash S, what, what, what are all those switches and what do they do? Or you can use it practically and have a lot more fun doing it. So which one sounds better to you? The best way to learn any protocol is to just capture it and have a look at what it's actually doing, not what the textbook tells you it's doing. So take it away, Chris. Show us what you, you know, I'm hoping you're going to start Wireshark like right now and show us what's going on. Yeah, why not? That's always fun. Let's take uh, let's get those packets going. So Nmap, let's just take a look at Nmap. So so basically what Nmap does, it's network mapper, all right? So it allows us to discover devices on a network. Why is that important? Well, how are we going to go in and try to hack a device or even inventory devices? I've used Nmap just scanning around my own network and taking a look at what's there and what ports are available, even doing like an internal pen test on myself. And Nmap allows us to do that. Now, there's a thousand switches with Nmap or options. And if you look through the, the actual help of Nmap, uh, there's a lot that it can do. And we can see some of those here, David. Look at all these switches. So we have Host discovery, target specification, scan techniques, port specification, looking at services, even enumerating operating systems. So we can take Nmap and we can launch it at a device and we can learn a lot more about the type of OS that that device is running. Why important? Because how can I find a vulnerability to then exploit if I don't know the operating system? Okay, so... Yeah, I'm hoping you're going to show us at some point. I, I believe that's in a separate video. We, we, we're going to cover that as well. Yeah. yeah, we'll get there. But first, we want to just talk about some basics and understand more yeah. about how Nmap works. So let's just do this. Now, Like a question would be like, what's the difference between a, like a normal scan and a stealth scan? And, uh, you know, there's a lot of options in Nmap. So hopefully you're going to show us some of that. Yeah, for sure. So I think the two biggest ones are, I should say, not, Maybe biggest is the wrong word, but uh, two of the ones that you're definitely going to be learning and using uh, have to do with TCP connections. All right. And you're going to find that there's two major ones. Uh, if we come here to scan techniques, you can see the first two here, SS and ST. So this is TCP SYN and connect. Now, those are different. There's a difference between TCP SYN scan and connect scan. And that's what we're going to really focus on today. Maybe... In other videos, we'll get into Finn, Christmas Scan, and uh, some of these other ones, even UDP Scan. But for today, we're really going to focus on those first two. So does that sound like a good time to you? Yeah, I mean, it'd be good to know the difference. So yeah, hopefully you're going to like show us the packets. Absolutely. So let's do this. First, I'm just going to say Nmap, and here's the way to remember it. If it's a scan, then use dash S, lower S. There's your small s. And then the next letter that you use that's going to tell you the type of scan that you're going to do. Is it an ARP scan? Well, huh, that's ARP. 
Oops, there we go. Bottom S. That would be an ARP scan. How about a UDP scan? How about a, a connect scan is T? All right, so a lot of times you can just use the, the name of the scan to figure out the type of scan it is, a thin scan. Um, now there's different reasons why you would use each one and we'll build on that. But just to get this right out the gate, let's have everybody, if you don't have Nmap, then go get it and follow along with me here. You can just do Nmap and you can just do, uh, let's just do a, a, a SIN scan. And I'm gonna come over here. I'm just gonna start this up here. Let's start up this capture. You can see a lot of our, uh, our, our, our traffic going on here in the background. What I'm gonna do is just, just launch it, okay? Let's just grab a device and let's just see what we do. What I am going to do though, I'm just gonna do dash F. There's a reason for that. That's just a, it's a fast scan. It's only going to test the top 100 ports. The number of ports that are available, again, another test question that you might find, uh, there's 65,535 ports that TCP can possibly have open, right? So we don't want to have to just destroy a device as we're trying to scan it. Uh, let's just, just be a little bit more simple with it. And we're just, oh, look at that. Sorry, forgot about my root privileges. Got to come back. I'm just going to do sudo because it does, a lot of scans require to administrative privileges on the system. So it's a lot of times you're gonna have to do uh, sudo. So there we go. And let me just run this. One second, password. Are you running this on your Mac or on Linux? I'm running this on my Mac right now. The nice thing is that the, um, the, the commands are gonna be all the same, right? So if you're on Kali, uh, and really uh, even on Windows, I mean, you're gonna find, except for the sudo part, you're just gonna have to run your terminal as administrator, okay? So if you notice here on my capture over here, and I'm just gonna set a filter. If you didn't know, you can set a filter while you have a capture running. And that'll filter on just the traffic going to this device. All right, so I've got a device out here. I'm just gonna stop my capture. I've got a device out here and I have TCP 53 is open. There's one open port. And then the other one is 1900 using the SIN scan. Okay, cool. Well, uh, let's go ahead and take a look at just on this live capture. I'm gonna show you this live, David, and then I'm gonna open up another capture that has a few more interesting ports. And we're actually gonna be able to share that with everybody. You can go down to the description down below and you can download the Stealth Scan PCAP and you'll be able to follow right along with me. So we'll get to that in just a moment. But what I wanna do is I just wanna filter. So let's just do, okay, 4.1 was our device and let's just do and. TCP port equals equals 53. Let's see what we get. All right, so here we can see that here's our client. It established a connection or it sent out that TCP SYN to 4.1, that was our target. And we're sending this to TCP port 53. Well, seven milliseconds later, we get a SYN ACK back. But notice what happens right after that. Our client says, nah, let's reset. This is known as a half open scan. The reason is because we only have half of the connection open. A TCP connection is not open until you have sent a SYN and you have received an ACK for that SYN. So as a client, I got my ACK. So I sent my SYN and I got the ACK for that SYN. But the server sent his SYN, I never sent no ACK. I just went, nah, reset. So that's why it's called half open. Now in Nmap, that type of scan is called a stealth scan, right? So SS, okay? So, so that's uh, any port that is open and available is going to respond with that SYNAC. If it's a port that is not open, let's go ahead and try port 80. This is what we're gonna see. I send out my SYN and I got a reset ACK back. So this one's closed. The server reset it because we it doesn't have that port open, yeah? Correct. When you hit a port that is closed, sorry, talk to the hand, reset. Yeah. All right, so. And that's how Wireshark knows that the ports are open. Sorry, not Wireshark, that's how Nmap knows that the ports are open because it's getting an act. Correct. When I send a SYN and I get a SYN act back, that port is open. Simply, let's just call that the, the stealth scan. Now, let's think about this though. Why would this be called a stealth scan? Well, basically, back in the day, it was thought, well, okay, if, if I send this SYN and then it gets a SYN ACK and I reset it right away, well, maybe that device that I'm trying to enumerate, I'm trying to attack, 
uh, maybe it won't log it. Where if I do a full TCP connect scan, the potential is there that it'll go, oh, there was a connection attempt and it was reset. Really anymore, most systems today, even on the end map, uh, if you go out to the end map website, they even tell you. Uh, they're like, yeah, stealth might not be the right word for it anymore because a lot of IDS systems will find this anyway, right? So it's not like one is really clandestine and secret and the full connect scan is going to be just out in the open. If you're a enumerated network, if you're pen testing, likely you're going to be found if you just launch this thing on a network. So uh, should we contrast the connect scan? Yeah, I was going to ask you, how's that different to a standards like connect sta uh, scan, sorry? Shall we? Let's do it. Uh, I'm just going to start up another capture. And then what I'll do is I'll flip over to the other ones that we're going to share with everybody. So everybody can be on the same packet page. All right, so let's do this. I'm going to go ahead and start my little capture. Got it going. Now let's come over here. I'm just going to do sudo again. But this time, I'm going to do st. That's all I changed. Now let's see how that changes things. All right, so we have those same two ports open. And I'm going to come over here. Let's just do an and TCP port equals equals 53. So let's take a look at this connection. Now, what's different here? If I, I have a SYN, and I got a SYN ACK, but this time the client or the tool acts back. This is a full connection. Right after that, only a whopping 18 microseconds later, we send a uh, reset. So basically, hey, David, you there? Yep, I'm here. Great, bye. That's a full connect scan. Now, there are some other differences here that I'd like to point out that if you are looking at traffic on your network, there are some differences between these two types of scans that you, if you see them in Wireshark, you'll be able to quickly tell the difference. More than just the half open and the full handshake. There's also some, some things that Nmap is doing or not doing with these scans that I'd like to point out too. Let's go ahead and flip over to the, the other uh, trace file. All right, so in this PCAP, which I'm going to share with everybody, you can hit that link in the description down below. Um, what I did is I went ahead and scanned a much more open device, a device that had a whole lot more ports open. So in this scan, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at just that, that SYN scan, but how certain things would jump out to us if we were looking at normal network traffic, this is where it turns into the real world, David. If we're a SOC analyst, blue team, if we're looking at PCAPs from our environment, how can I know if my stuff's getting scanned? And that's what my clients come to me for. They'll send me, here's a terabyte hard drive full of stuff. Here's a bunch of captures, like what's going on and um, where are we getting attacked? Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look from a scan perspective anyway. Let's just pick a port here. So I'm just gonna do tcp.port equals equals 80. All right, so right out the gate, we can see that this was a scan going to port 80 among others. So if everyone put that port scan there. So here we have sin, synac, and then we have a reset. There's our stealth scan. But there's a few other things that are that we can take a look at that look a little bit interesting in this type of scan. So I'm just gonna go to that first SYN. Now, here's the thing. When we send a SYN scan, the, the stealth one, Nmap is actually generating that scan. It's actually coming from the tool itself. So Nmap is generating that SYN, putting in things like, for example, oh, let's just pick out some stuff, window. The window is 1024. If everybody's seen some of our TCP deep dive stuff that we've done, David, you, you know that I'm advertising that I only have enough room in my receive buffer for 1024 bytes. That's TD. Okay. So that's something that might catch my attention. Something else, if I look at that SYN, if I come down here to options, the only TCP option that, that the Nmap stealth scan is offering to the other side is an MSS. In the real world, when you're looking at true TCP connections, true SINs that are happening, that's not the case. You're gonna have a lot of TCP options. You're gonna have things, you're gonna see stuff like uh, timestamps, and you're gonna see window size and s selective acknowledgement, SAC. You're not gonna just see only one TCP option, typically. So in other words, what you're saying is you know this is dodgy traffic, for lack of a better word, because the window size is really small. 
and there are not enough options. Oh, that would flag my attention in a heartbeat. Absolutely. But how would you find that in like a terabyte of data? How do you find this stuff, Chris? Because like needle and haystack type stuff. Glad you asked, David. Well, why don't we come down to window and let's actually talk about that for a moment. How would I set a Wireshark filter that uh, will directly find this? So first of all, finding a packet that I would be interested in finding later is a, is a great way to do it. What is it that makes this packet unique? Well, first of all, I got a window, right? So let me go ahead and right click that and I'm gonna come up here to prepare as filter and I'm gonna go to selected. Okay, so tcp.window underscore size underscore value equals equals 1024. Ugh, that's a mouthful. Do I ever wanna have to type that out? No, of course not. That's why I can find a packet with that field I can borrow from down here on the bottom left, tcp.window, size, value, all that, and I can send that upstairs. Or what I could do is I could just take this. This is another kind of cool thing about Wireshark. You see how I'm dragging this right now? I can also drag and drop that filter. Super cool. In fact, another thing that would be weird about this, I only have so many options. There's not a whole lot here. There's only one option. So something else that might catch my attention, there's a couple ways that we could filter on this. Let's come up to header length and I'm just going to right click prepare as filter and I'm gonna say and selected. Now let's see what we just did. I said, show any packet that has 1024 as the window size and also the TCP header length is 24. All right, what does that mean? Well. Basically, the TCP header without any options, without anything else going on, is 20 bytes. You've got your source port, destination port, sequence numbers, acknowledgement numbers, flags, window, all that stuff, right up to urgent pointer. That's the last part of the 20 bytes. After that, if I have options, there's some extra stuff. If this isn't the beginning of a handshake, which by the way, let's not forget that we need this to be a sin, right? So let's go ahead and right click flags as well. And I'm just gonna say prepare as filter, and selected. So look at we're building this filter out. If this is a sin, which is flags, what I'm doing is instead of just focusing on that individual bit of a sin, I'm saying take that whole flags field and the only bit that will be set is sin. If I say sin, if I do this another way, if I say tcp.flags sin equals equals one, that's gonna get sins and sin acts. I only want the sins. Let's go ahead and back up. So I'm just saying flags as a whole, here's the hexadecimal value. And if you look sideways down here, that's for the, the hexadecimal people out there, I've got zero, 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 one, zero. That's a two. That's why it's zero, zero, two, right? So I just want that sin location to be one. That's why my flags are zero, zero, two. So let's see what we did with this filter. This is only sins. This is sins that are advertising a TCP window size of 1024, and that header length is only gonna be 24 bytes. Now let's talk about that for another moment. The header length. Again, TCP is gonna have a 20 byte header, and at the beginning, if there's a lot of different options, that header length is going to be much larger. It's gonna be another 20 bytes or so. So this would catch a stealth scan. Is it always 24 on Nmap? Or is it like, can you change that? Or is that just the default, yeah? For the stealth scan, tell you what, why don't we test this against a couple other packets? Let's actually apply this thing. All right, so I got a thousand packets and I know for a fact that I sent a thousand when I did this scan, I did it with the thousand most common ports. Right there, I'm able to see um, that it caught everything. And you just did like a, a stealth scan like we did a, a few minutes ago with no, you didn't specify anything else. So that was just the default values. Correct. If I want to, I can come over here and this is probably a, a, a good way to actually show it so we learn it better. Um, if I do dash P, that's for port. And right after that, that's where we can specify, do we want specific ports? Do we want uh, a range of ports? If I wanna be specific, I can say one to 1000. Or let's just say, um, if, uh, if we don't leave this, then what it's gonna do is it's gonna try the top 1000. It's gonna say, these are the most common ports. If I don't want a thousand, if I want to run a little faster, that's that dash F. It's just gonna do the top 100. Yeah, what's interesting is that it's using like a window size of 1024 and the TCP header is 24. So that's a, just looking for 24 byte header is an easy way to see if someone's scanning your network unless they've 
made specific changes to try and hide what they're doing. Exactly. That's the and that's the thing. You know, when we're talking about cybersecurity, it's hard to make absolutes. All, all an attacker would need to do is change this to twenty five bytes. How did you discover this? Is it just you were looking through data and then suddenly you thought, well, this just looks weird? Yeah, that's exactly what I did. Let's go ahead and run that uh, full scan again. And what I'd like to do is show you how that would change when I'm looking at a full scan. Let's go ahead and, and check that out. All right. So I'm going to start my start my capture. And let's just run this guy, only this time we're gonna do the ST, and I'm gonna show you. Because remember, that was for the stealth. So what I started to do is, I was, I was just looking at these scans, I started to realize, oh, and we already we already caught that, that scan, let me stop. Okay, so let's see what's different. Let's see if everybody can pick this out. Full connect. So first of all, what's our header length? Right, that's different. And sin's the same. But if I come down to my window, I've got a complete 65535 window. So on the full connect scan, look at all the options I have. Yeah, very different. SAC, timestamps, window scale. And that's more realistic for proper traffic in the network. Exactly. Here's the reason why these are different. Now, the audience might be thinking, great, okay, so the stealth scan looks weird, but the connect scan doesn't. And that's because Nmap doesn't generate this on its own. What it does is it issues a connect call down to the operating system kernel stack. And it says, hey, you, TCP, you generate this connection. I'm not going to do it as a, as a tool. I want the actual that's interesting. Yeah. operating system to do it. That's why this SIN looks so much different. Because the, the true OS stack is the one that actually generated this, and that's why it looks much more real. Uh, a real window, a useful TCP window. So instead of saying, um, hey, David, do you want to connect? You can only send me 1,000 bytes. Now I'm saying, hey, David, do you want to connect? I'm going to start out with 65535 as a window. By the way, you're going to be able to multiply that bad boy by 64. So we're going to have a big, cool bucket of data to work with. Right, that's that's why that caught my attention when I was uh, when I was looking at those stealth scans because this was so low. I mean, in in some ways, the stealth scan is less stealthy compared to this, isn't it? To me, yeah, I would catch it way faster yeah. than I would this for sure. Yeah. Is there anything here though that looks weird? Was it just because you see? How would you catch this? I would come to this part of uh, of Wireshark, and this is called TCP conversation completeness. Now, what on earth is conversation completeness? Well, glad you asked. Basically, what this does is it assigns values to different aspects of the TCP conversation. So he here's a standard conversation. So basically, what, what conversation completeness does in Wireshark, uh, this is uh, basically, it's a, it's a cool little feature. It's come out just in the, in the recent year, really. So basically, a full TCP conversation that is normal and healthy it has, has a beginning, so a handshake, okay? And the first packet of a TCP handshake, everybody, is? Sun. <laughs> Good job. All right, yes, you got a gold star. Thanks. All right, I can't believe I'm giving David Bombal gold stars. Anyway. Yeah, no, I know nothing. I know nothing about this. <laughs> okay, all right. No, yeah, no, a lot of things. Okay, how about the second packet, everybody? What's that one called? Yeah, come on, Sunak. Good job, okay. Here we go, and whoops. All right, da, da, da. flushed out. All right, last packet is Ack. Good job with our handshake. Okay, we've already seen this in our, um, our Nmap scan, okay? So there's our handshake. So a connection began, data gets exchanged, okay? Acknowledged, okay? And then this connection gets shut down, so uh, this could happen any any way, either through a fin or a reset. Okay, so let's just say, I'm just going to shorten this out and just call this fin, okay? This is a complete conversation in TCP, so-called, all right? Now, what Wireshark does is it is, it's assigns values to each one of these functions. Sin, this gets a little deep, and we're going to, actually, I'm going to link the Wireshark page and the actual... Um, information or the, the uh, wiki where it talks about each of these values, but we'll just go over it together. So basically the sin gets a value of one, 
Sinek gets a value of two. The ACK gets a value of three, or of four. This is binary. Okay. A reset down here is 32. And the fins are 16. And data is eight. All right. Do you see the, the binary way we count? So one, two, four, eight, 16, 32. So basically, the way that TCP completeness is calculated, all right, so we have a TCP completeness of 39. All right. So what this means is we saw a one, we saw a two, we saw a four. That's seven. And then we saw a reset. We add all that up. And when we see a handshake followed by a reset, that is a TCP completeness of 39. Yeah, so no data sent, yeah. And that's why it says no data. Yeah. yeah. So in this case... That's weird, isn't it? Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it means, um, okay, does this happen in the real world? Yes, it does. Does it happen often in the real world? It shouldn't. If I said TCP completeness, and this is where I would do this, Dave, this is where I would look a little closer... I would say prepare as filter, and let's do and selected. And I'm going to go ahead and remove my port off of this just to keep things more open. Um, oh, you don't like the parentheses. Hang on. All right, so anything to and from this host, TCP completeness is 39. This is going to show me when a connection was con attempted, Synac came back, ACK went out, and a reset happened right away. Right away, I would be thinking, if I saw one of these, David, maybe I wouldn't be super worried about it. If I saw thousands of these, hey. Someone's scanning. Absolutely. So this is one way that we can filter for that. TCP completeness is 39. How did you discover this, Chris? Is it just like you, were, you, you just captured packets and then you looked at what was weird based on what you normally see, yeah? Uh, good question, and yes. Um, for me, as far as the TP, TCP completeness thing goes, what I thought was, okay, how can I capture a handshake that is immediately reset? That's a tough filter to build, right? It's like, if you do that by hand, uh, that's, that's a long filter, <laughs> I gotta say. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, basically what I gotta do to, to do the equivalent thing that conversation completeness is doing, first I gotta set a filter for sin, and then I gotta set a filter for uh, an ACK that has a sequence number of one and an ACK number of one and reset on the same port number. Ugh. It's just, I'm confused even explaining what I just ex uh, explained. So that's part of the reason why the amazing people behind Wireshark uh, came up with conversation completeness is because we could do these kinds of tests where we could say, hey, how far did the TCP conversation get and this is really useful when it comes to port scans. So another thing that I could do is I could set TCP completeness. Let's just say that I'm only looking for a SYN and a reset. Well, the SYN is one, the reset is 32. That could be 33. Now I can use that feature of Wireshark to get a better handle on um, how much of this scan activity has. And it all goes back to, if I see it once, maybe I'm not super worried, but if I see a pattern here, or even if someone comes into Nmap and slows the scan down, which by the way we can do, we can say, hey, be really stealthy. Only let out a few of these every couple minutes or seconds. You'll still pick it up though. You can still pick it up. I mean, I suppose the problem is if you do it over a long period of time, you can have so much data. So your capturing device has to have the capacity. And Chris, we, that gets us to another conversation. Are devices good enough today to capture huge amounts of data? Um, or do you need specialist devices? That's a great question. Um, okay, so here, here's your threshold. And this is what I, I, I do. Okay, so I'm a, I'm a packet consultant, right? I, I get paid to go in and find problems. The last thing that I want is missing data. Because sometimes it comes down to that one packet that the analyzer missed and as soon as I see that, I start to doubt my whole trace file, okay? So sometimes people will send me PCAPs, even from YouTube. They'll watch a, a video like this, and they'll say, hey, I just need some help analyzing this certain problem, which is great. They, they can interact and send a PCAP. And right away, if I see a previous packet not captured 
or if I see symptoms, if it almost looks like false retransmissions, which it does take some time to learn how to identify that, which you and I could continue to, to chat about. But the point is if I have, uh, I call it dirty data. <laughs> if, I, if, my, if my data is missing, then I start to question my whole uh, PCAP, right? I, uh, packets of the gold yeah, standard. It's unreliable, yeah. It's unreliable. Yeah, it's unreliable. So your question yeah. was how well does, does uh, hard, hardware keep up? Well, I think everybody knows that a laptop, Wireshark with a laptop, in normal data center world, it can't keep up with super high data rates. Most network engineers know that. If I, if I ask them, can, uh, can a copy of Wireshark on a laptop keep up with 10 gig? Most people are going to say, oh, no. Okay, then when does it start to fall? Yeah, exactly. My benchmarking shows that most of the machines that I have had and done my best to optimize, I'm, I'm not able to accurately capture timestamps and everything, much over 100 megabits per second. Oh, wow, that's low. Yeah, it's low. When you go to site, do you have a laptop or what do you do? Um, do you have like specialist hardware? What do you do? So, so yeah, Dave, that's a good question. And let me just show you what I use, um, just because it's backpackable, if that's a word. So this is actually the Profits app, IOTA. And literally what it is, is it's a hard drive, terabyte hard drive with a tap built in, All right? So I can go network one way, then device under test the other way, or I can connect it between two switches on the uplink, but it comes in 10 gig as well and beyond, depending on the money you want to spend. And then it's got a management port. All I have to do is I literally plug this guy in, power it, and then there's a little button here. See that little guy, that button? Yep. Capture. And you just let it run for a while. Yep. I let it cook, let it grab all the traffic that it can. And then what I can do is interface with it and I can, I can pull PCAPs back from it, or I can also use some of the analytics that are built in. So uh, a lot of times I have this running even on my home network, just to keep an eye on things and look for scan activity like we're talking about. Uh, a lot of times I find my own. But uh, <laughs> right, part of what this does is it allows me to go to a period of time where I say, hey, client, hey, customer, what time was it when this happened? And I train them to tell me, oh, it happened at 3.30, Chris. Okay, cool. At least I can go to that time index and I can back up five minutes and go forward five minutes and I can extract that, that, that component, right? So capture better, capture smarter. No one should be digging through a single PCAP that is you know, um, a terabyte. I mean, that's important to know. I mean, the the other question is, okay, so you've got like a terabyte of data, whatever it is. I mean, that it's going back to that whole question, how on earth do you find things? So, I mean, you've given us some good tips, but have you got any other like, just from your experience, how would you, you know, you've got this crazy big file. How do you even start to look at that stuff? Right. So there's two ways. One, um, you can do make use of the command line tools. So from there, when you install Wireshark, you also have command line tools like uh, T-Shark, Edit Cap, Merge Cap, uh, these other tools. You actually install like nine different tools, something like that, when you put Wireshark on there. Those tools have a much better time with very large trace files. So sometimes what I'll do, if someone just literally gives me a hard drive full of data, what I might do, if it's a super large PCAP, what I'll do is I'll go in and break it up. I can go in and say, just break this up into smaller pieces. Better though, let me show you the real thing that I do. Yeah, please. This is legit real world. Something that I train my, in my students and my classes, I talk a lot about this, and I know we've left off from Nmap, but this is a really important part of capturing this stuff in the real world. Um, what I do is I, I try to train them from the beginning to capture wisely and one way is by using, let's just go ahead and use a uh, dump cap. Now, a lot of times when you're in Wireshark, Wireshark actually calls dump cap to do the actual capturing. Dump cap is a, it's a tool that gets installed with Wireshark if you don't already have it, or another one that a lot of people might use on a server or on interface is TCP dump, right? So what I'll do is I'll say, okay, let's just go ahead and do this. Let's go to dump cap, okay? Now, if I go to dump cap dash D, this is going to show me all the interfaces that I have access to for doing PCAPs to capture from. Let's just grab the first one. This is a Wi-Fi interface. 
Okay, so let's just do dump cap dash I, so that's interface one. So I'm saying, hey, dump cap, go grab a bunch of packets off of this interface. And if I just let this thing fly, it's gonna go great. It's gonna start to dump that traffic into a temp folder and it's just gonna call it Wireshark Wi-Fi. And David, this will go until I stop it. This is gonna be a big trace file, especially if I leave it for a full day. Well, I don't want that. So instead what I'm gonna do, let me just back out of that guy. What I'm gonna do is give it some parameters. So I'm gonna say, actually it's called, uh, if, you, if you look at the help menus, you'll see this, but if you go dash B, you can do file size. And in kilobytes, I give it the amount of traffic. So my file size, let's just say, doo -doo -doo. okay, so one kilobyte, 10 kilobyte files, 100 kilobytes, meg. That's a, that's a 100 meg file. So what I'm saying is dump this into a 100 megabyte file. Then dash B files. And I can say, let's just start with 10. Okay, so what that does, the file switch, is it says save 10 of them. And then let's just say, I'm just going to write this out. And I know there's a lot of switches here, but... Um, you yeah, know, it makes sense, though. And I mean, this is a lot more efficient at grabbing, grabbing traffic rather than the Wireshark GUI. Like you said, the, the Wireshark GUI actually goes and uses this. Absolutely, yeah. I just started what's called a ring buffer. Now this, this gets back to your question. How do you find this in an ocean of packets? How do you find the, the three that make the difference? Well, first of all, let's capture smarter. So what I did is I started a capture. I said, I want 100 megabyte files and I want 10 of them. So what this does is it starts, it's called a ring buffer on my machine. Now I'm gonna grab 10 files of 100 megabytes each. And after the 10th one, it's gonna go overwrite the first one. Okay, so it's continuous. Yep, ring buffer. So now I can play with these numbers. I can go, you know, 100 megabytes is too small. Why don't we bump that up to 500 megabytes? And I got some, I got some horsepower to work with on my hard drive. So why don't I go ahead and up this to 100 files? And that'll give me more time. Point is, David has a problem and he goes, oh, that weird thing happened that I'm troubleshooting. Or things look kind of funny. Uh, it happened, whatever we're troubleshooting. And I say, hey, David, around, around what time was that? And if you say, he's like, oh, it was about 8.30. Cool, I can go back to my ring buffer and I can look at my time date stamps that are right here. And I can say, okay, this is, look at us, we're at 2.22.22. For me, it's 10.56 a.m. And I can just find the one that happened, okay, I'll change from 8.30 in your example to 11 a.m., right? So I can find the one that was capturing during that period of time. And now I just went from a terabyte hard drive down to a hundred megabyte file. Yeah, yeah. So capture smart. Capture smart. I try to make my PCAPs as small as I can. And also uh, when we're looking at real data, really be focused on um, the when, the what. The wrong thing to do, David, is just to jump in and just hope that we get the right packets at the right time, right? We, we need more information. When did it happen? What type of thing occurred? And when we're doing cybersecurity, open captures like this, just it's a lot easier and more digestible when we're dealing with these smaller PCAPs. I remember the, you know, doing a lot of network, network troubleshooting. The hardest problems are the transient, uh, like weird things that just happen seemingly randomly. It's so hard to try and troubleshoot that stuff. So I like what you're doing, you know, like let it run. You know, if this is running continuously and just overriding itself, then, you know, the, I'm a, you, you correct me if I'm wrong, but like the client's running this and then when something happens, they can call you, okay, it's happened now. Or, you know, they can try and give you a, a time when it happened that day. And then it gives you time to go back and look at actually what happened at that time rather than just trying to guess. Absolutely. In fact, let me show you one, one other thing that I do. I'll get this, this capture going either locally on their system or somewhere on the network off of a span port, a tap. And what I'll do is I'll come in and imagine this is the user's machine, okay? This is, I just have a test copy of Windows running here. Here's a VM. Um, but what I'll do is I'll go into their system and I'll say, okay, uh, let's go ahead and just do new, let's just do a shortcut. And I'm literally just gonna type in my personal website Okay, www.packetpioneer.com. Okay, the reason is because it's unlikely 
that that person, that end user that I'm trying to resolve is just going to go out to my personal website. That's an unlikely thing to happen. It used to be that we would do this with Telnet. Um, back in, you know, when Telnet was just a, it was a part of a standard tool set that was still on Windows. People didn't use Telnet because it's open and you can see the traffic that's actually happening. You can grab passwords and things. But now SSH, people are doing that through Putty and such. What I just need to do is I just need to find something to trigger on, right? So what I do is I name this, it happened. Okay, I put that right over here on their desktop. And then I say, David, go about your business, do your work. And then the next time it happens, just go double click that and it'll go out and it'll go to my website. What does that do? Well, now I can stop my capture. And this is a great little example here. And let me gotta find where that file went. I think it's just on my root. There we go, yeah. Okay, so now I'm back in Wireshark, right? So I've got a ton of stuff here. I've got 100,000 packets. How do I find the one where- It happened. Yeah. It happened, right? So let me just do frame contains packet pioneer. And I'm going to get all the packets that contain that name. Now I'm, I am packet pioneer, right? So, but I can see, uh, I actually tested this once and here we have it again. So usually you're just gonna see right here, now I have a, a bookmark. Now I've got Packet Pioneer. This is where this was actually generated. And um, we. I can now look around that period of time in the PCAP and that's that allows me to set other filters for when it happened. That's great. So in other words, you, you find the timestamp just off that like marker and then you can say like five minutes after that or but 10 minutes before it or whatever. Yep, then I can come up here to view, time display format, time of day, and now David said it happened at 11.03 and he hit the it happened icon and now I have two bookmarks. I have a, a period of time, but just in case my time sync isn't correct on the, the capture device, now I can know also from the packets themselves, he hit the it happened icon. That's brilliant. But I mean, are there anything, any last like parting thoughts about tips that you've got from the real world? I mean, we started with Nmap and we kind of like morphed into like real world, real world stuff. But I think it's important because you like highlighting what's weird on networks. Um, any other quick tips before we wrap it up? Yeah, I think uh, for me, I don't get something until I see it at the packet level, especially getting into cybersecurity um, it, with with those that are. At, you know, if they're new to cybersecurity or if they're learning how these tools work, Wireshark is a great way to have that open and get that thing capturing while running these tests. Don't do that thing where you just become, um, you're just generating a tool or you're using a tool and hitting a button and then watching some output that you don't understand. Wireshark is a tool that can help you to understand it. And David, hopefully you and I continue to do this kind of content where uh, we can walk people through what to look for on the wire. To the audience, please put in the comments below stuff that you want Chris and I to discuss. I mean, the good news, Chris, is we, we, we're planning to do a whole bunch of videos. Um, and I think we want to cover as many protocols as we can. I want to twist you to get back for more TCP deep dive stuff, UDP deep dive, and some other protocols. So yeah, there's a lot to cover. Chris, really want to thank you, you know, for sharing your knowledge for free. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me back, David. I always enjoy hanging out with you. And of course, everybody who watched too. Brilliant. Thanks, Chris.